Thank you very much. So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming on down. I uh, hope we're all wonderfully caffeinated. Please feel free to take notes and ask questions at the end um, as I get to prattle on about what I did my PhD on and what I'm doing about it now. So, I'm Paddy. I'm a rocket scientist. I did my PhD in physics at the University of Sydney uh, studying a particular type of plasma source. System works rather like an electric welder. You strike the electric arc, you create plasma, and you can do cool stuff with it. Sort of stuff that you can use to solve problems. Everyone's got problems, right? My problem is not that satellites are really useful, but that they need fuel for station keeping. Satellites are useful only if you put them in the right spot. This way, they can look at the right things, they can talk to the ground stations, they can do whatever it is you want your satellites to do, but they've got to be in the right part of space. Space is big, the useful parts of space, however, aren't that big. Certain orbits are getting crowded, in particular the Earth observation orbits that we use for weather satellites, that people are starting to use for uh, low Earth orbit communication systems as well, as well as various three-letter agencies of uh, security agency sort of ideas, also for Earth observation. Similarly, the geosynchronous orbit at about 36,000 kilometers altitude, which is where you have the big geostationary communication satellites, that's also pretty crowded. And people have to have particular rules about how they can actually keep using this, how they can deal with their own junk. Because if the junk hits a working piece of satellite, or even if two bits of junk collide, they're gonna create shrapnel clouds. Orbital velocity in low Earth orbit is about eight kilometers per second. Out at geosynchronous, this is only about three and a half, four kilometers a second. So there's a lot of kinetic energy in one of these systems. If you have two washing machine sized weather satellites, each at about 500 kilos hit each other, that's a ton of shrapnel. And that ton of shrapnel is gonna spread out throughout both of their orbital planes and make life difficult for everyone. The NASA scientist Donald Kessler back in the 70s posited the idea that if I've got a couple of satellites that hit each other and create shrapnel, that shrapnel could hit other satellites and disrupt them and create yet more shrapnel, leading to a self-sustaining cascade. And like all good diseases, it's got called the Kessler syndrome after the person who first wrote down the idea about it. We're getting perilously close to the self-sustaining densities of Kessler syndrome in certain orbits. So people need to actually start doing something about it, otherwise we're gonna get a debris cascade like in the motion picture gravity. However, no one really wants to pay for it. It's rather expensive putting stuff up in space, and if what you're gonna be doing is putting stuff up in space just to get rid of other bits and pieces, that's gonna cost. Uh, ED Orbit is a mission that the European Space Agency is running to try and deorbit one of their old Earth observation satellites called Envisat. Envy satellite, Envysat was launched in uh, 2002. It was designed to have a five year lifespan, but it kept working until 2012. So they were really quite happy with it. It was giving very good information, very high resolution Earth observation data for climate, for weather, for soil moisture, for all these important things. And then something went wrong with the radio and we don't know what. It has not been, no one's been able to communicate with it since 2012, and it's eight and a half tons of uncontrolled satellite with highly explosive chemical fuel on board going through the same orbital bands that all the other Earth observation satellites are going through as well. So the European Space Agency wants to get rid of it in a safe and controlled fashion, and the price tag for that, mil for that mission is starting to creep north of 180 million euros for one satellite. So it's an important thing, and we do have to do something about it, but it costs a whole lot, so nobody really wants to do it because no one likes paying out that sort of money. I mean, I didn't even have that sort of money. It even makes me feel a bit weird. So this is, comes down to there being weak regulation and weak enforcement. There is no law of space. There are a bunch of treaties because everyone kind of agrees that space is awesome and would be great if we could all use it, but if there was a law of space, that would mean that there is some nation passing those laws, and that would mean that space would kind of sort of belong to that nation, and everyone's kind of 
understandably leery about this. So there's very weak regulation, very weak enforcement, even though that safety orbit of non-responsive debris is possible, it's just wasteful and expensive. I mean, expensive, we've already covered that one. Wasteful, someone's already spent 10,000 US a kilo and the rest to put that material in space. It'd be nice if someone could use it. So, we start, we've addressed the problem. Now we start looking at the market. How big are the resources that are able to help address this problem of space debris? Space economy, according to a report in 2000, 2015, it was worth about 330 billion US dollars in 2014, with approximately 9% annual growth compounded over the previous 30 odd years. So there's a lot of stuff happening in space, and most of this is uh, commercial these days rather than military or government. Uh, large geosynchronous communication satellites are worth about 500 million US a pop at 100 million, 200 million for launch and insurance. And you can understand why people don't want to spend a lot of money buying new satellites from, and will try and keep their old satellites going as long as they can. The lifetimes for these satellites are limited by fuel. If you run out of fuel, you can't move your satellite around to keep it in the correct orbit and to dodge debris. So if you're in geosynchronous, the International Telecommunications Union, which is part of the UN, says you have to move your satellite up to the graveyard orbit <coughs> before you run out of fuel, otherwise you don't get to use those parts of the radio spectrum anymore. It's about the only actual enforcement of any uh, degree mitigation guidelines we have in space. And it's because the ITU is effectively the, like, the local council of geosynchronous orbit. The OneWeb Consortium is a new mob. They want to put up a whole bunch of satellites in an orbit about 1,200 k's above the Earth's surface. They want to put up a couple of thousand satellites. SpaceX and Google and Facebook and all these other cool kids want to put up other large mega constellations of hundreds to thousands of satellites. But they're going to be in orbits where debris mitigation is going to be a challenge for them because they're going to be a large number of them, they're going to be in polar orbits, and they're going to be very high up, so there's not going to be a lot of uh, atmospheric drag to slow them down. Additionally, reusability is still in its infancy. Not many people have demonstrated reusability of rockets. First stage reusability is being demonstrated by SpaceX and Blue Origin, and Blue Origin has yet to put, a, put something in orbit. SpaceX has been, re has been reflying previ previously used first stage of Falcons, and that's awesome but no one's done any reuse of anything in orbit yet. There are various plans from various other mobs around the place putting together space tug and on-orbit services and repair uh, robots, which leads us to imperfect solutions. There are deorbit guidelines for objects in low Earth orbit. They say that after the mission is ended, it should deorbit safely after 25 years. But it's a, it'd be really nice if it could rather than it has to and here's the penalty if you don't. Because who would enforce it, right? CubeSats, the small little loaf of bread sized satellites, they tend to have a short lifespan if you release them from the International Space Station because the ISS's orbits at 400 Ks and there's a bunch of atmosphere up there that slows it down through drag. If your CubeSats are above 600 Ks because you could lift to orbit with somebody going up that high, that's not enough atmosphere for it to be deorbited within a few centuries. So you're gonna have a cannonball's worth of shrapnel orbiting for centuries, tumbling along. The reason why they're a 10 centimeter cube is because that's the smallest size we can reliably paint with radar. So we can kinda sorta track it most of the time, but if it gets hit by something and splits apart, we can't track that debris. That's a shrapnel cloud. So, it's kinda dodgy. The constellations that people want to put up tend to be of the 100 to 200 kilogram size of each satellite, and they are designed to deorbit. They're designed at the end of their lifespan to aim for the vague direction of the South Pacific Ocean and try and hit where there's nobody there. If you have a satellite coming and hitting your garage and cracking the roof open, you're going to be annoyed, and your insurance agency is going to try and get the money back or not, insurance agencies. Um, but it's gonna be a lot of headache for the lawyers. Probably some lawyers will afford a new yacht out of it, I don't know. 
Um, this is good practice to get into for these constellations, but what if your system is non-responsive? What if it's taken a micrometeorite to the, to the radio? What if it's out of fuel? What if it failed to deploy to the correct orbit in the first place, had to use a lot of its fuel to get to the correct orbit, and doesn't have enough fuel to deorbit? This is a problem. You need to be able to go up there and move it around. And these safety orbit practices are not yet demonstrated, especially for debris, especially for non-responsive, non as mentioned. Like I say, it's expensive due to the delta V required. Delta V is a technical term literally for the change in velocity required to go from one orbit to another. You need to change your velocity, hence delta V. Yeah, cool. Supersynchronous graveyard orbit, that's an imperfect solution as well. You put your dead communication satellite up into the graveyard orbit. It's about 200 kilometers in altitude above the graveyard orbit. But you're just kicking it down the road. Sure, it's where commsats go to die. But then you're just borrowing trouble for later generations. Someone's still going to have to do something with it. So to s form the scope of the solution, we're going to need something that'll solve a number of problem subsets. We're going to want safe and continued access to space because it's frightfully useful having weather satellites. I do like it how very few people die when typhoons hit countries these days compared to, say, Galveston in Texas in 1921, which was wiped off the map when, it, when I believe a modern Cat 3 hit it. 88,000 people died in Texas. With three days warning, people can, get, can grab their important goods and head to the high ground. We're also going to want to remove debris so we can continue getting access to space and have stuff keep working there. Kind of important. We're also going to want to do it cheap because, you know, if, if we can do it cheap, why not, right? This will require a better thruster technology because current sy generation systems have issues on fuel efficiency, the thruster lifetime, and trying to refuel the bastards. So. Our solution, pulsed arc thrusters. Use a solid conductive propellant. Pick a metal, any metal. We can use it as a fuel. Some metals are better than others. This means easy to refuel. Rather than trying to transfer pressurized gas in orbit or a reactive liquid, you just plug in a new piece of cathode rod, make sure the electric connections are working, and away you go. There's no risk of fuel explosions. Sure, you can light some metals up, magnesium, as we've all seen in high school science, but those are magnesium shavings. If you try and light a kilogram of solid magnesium bar, good luck. You'll be there all day with a welding torch. High specific impulse. Specific impulse is one of the efficiency metrics we use to compare rockets to another. It's kind of like miles per gallon, but for spaceships. The high specific impulse leads to a lot of available delta V, a lot of ability to change your velocity, which leads to a range of missions so you can do a lot of cool things. You also do not need a grid or neutralizer, which are parts of other thruster technologies that get worn out, that they fail, and that require specialized electrical circuits to run so our engineering would be simpler, and we'd have a longer lifespan. Our system is still experimental. You see a diagram in cross-section there. I believe the next slide would actually show you, will step through how it works. Um, we're currently transitioning through to engineering prototypes, currently. So our system has a cylindrical anode. We also have a concentric cathode. Effectively, what we do is we strike an electrical arc between the cathode and the anode, generate plasma from the arc, just like in an arc welder, except in an arc welder where you transfer the plasma onto the two bits of metal you're welding together, we let that plasma go downrange. And it goes like the clappers. We have a trigger pin. In an arc welder, the electrical field between cathode and anode rips apart air molecules and allows current to flow through the air, creating a plasma. If you're doing this in a vacuum, there's no air to do this with. So you have an electrical flashover to create the little bit of plasma you need to get the entire rest of the bank to go. We have a water jacketed cathode mount because you're going to need to cool this bastard somehow. And we have copper pipes. The copper pipes deliver both power and cooling. The cooling goes through the hollow bits in the middle of the pipe, and the power goes through the coppery parts. There's also copper pipes to support the anode, but I didn't include them on this diagram because it would get really complicated if I did. So similar to an arc welder, as I said, we have an electrical field between cathode and anode, which is created by charging up the cathode bank, uh, the capacitor bank. Sorry. When we flick the big on switch, we trigger the arc from the trigger pin. 
which creates effectively a short circuit between cathode and anode, which dumps power from the capacitor bank into the plasma, creating more plasma in a self-sustaining cascade as long as there is energy in the capacitor bank or until we flick the off switch. Cathode spots are created, uh, generated sorry, on the surface of the cathode. These are small spots on the surface of the cathode where the plasma is generated from, hence we call them cathode spots because physicists are really imaginative when it comes to naming things. As these spots move away from each other, they erode material from the surface of the cathode, creating a plasma from that material. So if I have a titanium cathode, I make a titanium plasma, and that titanium plasma streams away from the titanium cathode, and if I want to use this as a welder, I can form a titanium weld if I really want to. Or I can use it as a rocket exhaust, and titanium moves away at tens of kilometers per second. We've been doing some work to actually you know, transition this between a laboratory prototype to an engineering prototype and then to something we can test in space. This is a photograph of it in operation in our lab in beautiful sunny downtown Brompton. Um, this was taken as a freeze frame from a mobile phone movie. Hence, you've got that dark section at the left of the screen. That's the rasterization artifact because that's kind of how mobile phone cameras work. It's a bright blue-white because it's saturated all the pixels. We're taking a photograph of an arc welder, so it's really bright. However, what we can do is point out such things like the plasma, which is that big glowy bit moving to the left really fast. There's the anode, which is this guy right here. It's a cathode mount, which is backlit by the plasma. The cathode mount is made of brass. And for a sense of scale, that's an ISO 100 flange, so the pipe diameter going through the middle is 100 millimeters. The anode looks suspiciously like a 50 millimeter internal diameter copper pipe we got su surplus from a plumbing store, because it kind of is. So to throw around some results and some numbers, um, this is a, a plot from a paper I had published in Applied Physics Letters last year. This is magnesium data on the top, titanium data at the bottom, both from fresh, brand new, un unworn, unused surfaces. Um, you because applied physics letters does not like plots. You've got to put as much information on one plot as you can, so it's really complicated. Um, just looking up there, you can see the magnesium at the top, titanium at the bottom. Uh, jet power efficiency on both sides on the left axis, that's effectively trans, uh, how efficient the system is at transforming electrical energy into kinetic energy. So it's one of the power efficiency metrics. The right-hand side axis is fuel-specific impulse, which is the miles per gallon, but for spaceships. You'll notice that the purple triangles in both cases, hollow purple triangles, are the specific impulse with an electromagnetic nozzle put on board to compare it to what it works out well, like uh, without the nozzle. And you'll notice in both cases you see significant improvement. What's really cool about the magnesium plot is how it outperforms the two performance envelopes given by those little rectangles. The blue rectangle, and, big blue rectangle and the big purple rectangle are the performance envelope of NASA's HIPEP experimental system, which was a high-powered ion thruster. So I was really quite happy because they topped out at 9,600, and I've got data points there at 11,500. I'm kind of chuffed with that, really. Um, the best ion propulsion system you can buy off the shelf is the ZIPS 25 from L3. Shops out at 3,500 if you follow the manufacturer's warranties. If you dial up to 11 and take off the safeties, you can get that up to 4,500. The SNECMA PPS 1350 tops out about 1,660. Again, if you take off the safeties, you can get that up to about 1,800. Uh, the HEMPT is under development by the German Space Agency and tends to top out at 2,500 in ground tests. So I'm really quite happy with how that's working out. Because we can then use a little equation called the rocket equation to figure out how much delta V you've got, assuming you know the effective exhaust velocity, and you assume a mass fraction. Assume a fraction of mass before and mass after all of your uh, accelerations. So assume we've got magnesium fuel. Assume it doesn't work as good as it does in the lab in the real world, because it's life, right? Um, an exhaust velocity of 80 kilometers per second corresponds to a specific impulse of 8,000. Now, I've got data at 11,500, but let's say it works nowhere near as good as it does in the lab, and we go with 8,000, yeah? 
we're assuming low thrust trajectories because this is an electric propulsion system, and we're assuming that half of the sh mass of our spaceship is fuel. So you put a, you launch everything into low Earth orbit, and half of everything you launch is magnesium fuel. And you plug the numbers in, and it turns out your total delta V budget is about 55 and a half kilometers a second. So you can change the velocity of your spaceship by about 55 and a half k's a second. Sounds rather impressive. You need some scale, right, and to be able to put this into perspective. Turns out to go from low Earth orbit to any of the near Earth objects, that's about six to 12 k's a second. You want to go to Mars orbit, that's about 15 k's a second. You want to go to the main belt asteroids at 16 to 25, depending on the asteroid. Some of them go up to about 30, because main belts can be a little bit of a loose description sometimes. There are a lot of missions you can do. And you can use this sort of system to solve your problems. Because first application, better station keeping. If you're making this junk, why not make less junk? Why not have it last for longer? So more delta V leads to more Long, at least to longer lifetimes, higher efficiency. Geosynchronous commsats require 25 to 50 meters per second of delta V every year for north-south station keeping. If you've got a satellite out in geo, you've got two types of station keeping you need to do. There's called north-south, up and down from the equatorial plane, and that's required because the Earth's equatorial plane is not the same plane as its orbit around the sun or the moon's orbit around the Earth. So there's gravitational tugs from the sun and moon moving at north and south. So you've got to counteract those, otherwise your satellite wanders. Additionally, your Earth observation satellites, they're going to need 60 to 400, depending on their orbit, meters per second per year to fight drag. So if you want to keep your Earth observation satellites in the correct orbit, you're going to need to give them a bit of a push. Longer lifetimes lead to lower costs. With our system, you can have the same mass of fuel on board, simpler engineering as well, leading to longer lifetimes and thus better loan terms, longer amortization rates. Uh, cost of capital goes down. Um, also, it, our system can be designed refutable from day one. We're not going to be, we don't, we hope to not have to force people to go with the whole, nah, sorry mate, your thrust is not refutable. You're going to be buying a new satellite then, aren't you? because that's a bit of a crappy business model. Most end-of-life commsats have about 80% of the capability as they had at the beginning of life. They are limited by fuel. It used to be they were limited by electronics, but we've got a lot better at building electronics that can deal with the space environment over the past 50 years of putting communication satellites up in space. Um, however, this won't work for assets that are currently in space, because they already have their own legacy propulsion systems on board. But why not have a little tugboat, a little tow truck? Lifetime extension has been mooted before. Various people have talked about it. Dr. Benedict from Intelsat General did a wonderful paper, presented at an AIAA conference in 2014, where it wasn't even a subtext, it was a supertext of, please can somebody do it for us? Here's all the economics from everyone's perspective and how useful it would be. It's a fantastic paper. You can find it online. Um, Airbus and Orbital ATK have plans for the near future for on-orbit servicing and lifespan extension. Cost-effective lifetime extension is attractive to a large number of people because the continued revenue from existing assets can pay for the lifetime extension service. If a commsat costs 300 to 500 million US and you're getting 50 million a year from it, you're going to need about 15 years operation to break even. If a space tug costs you 10 million a year and you're still bringing in 50 million going forward, that's an extra 40 million a year you weren't, going, you weren't banking on getting. Additionally, you don't have to buy your new commsat just yet. It's gonna make things a lot more interesting for that market. No need to launch new satellites. It's gonna make uh, the launch providers a little bit sad, but you know, you get that sometimes. No need to upgrade your ground assets as well. I mean, so sure, you've got old computers that are to talk to your old satellites. You're going to need to upgrade it all at some point because you, you just run out of, you know, 286s, 486s, whatever. Um, NASA used to send people around to swap meets looking for Intel 8086 chips because they were the controllers running the solid rocket boosters. And Intel stopped making them about a year after they started doing the space shuttle. Because Intel started making better chips, basically. So. How do the numbers stack up for orbit raising, though? 
If I've got my space tug moving something in, while it's already up in orbit, keeping it in the right spot, that's really cool. But what if my satellite could get a lift all the way to its destination orbit and not have to use any of its onboard fuel to get there? Let's look at the numbers. If I have an orbit raising tug and I'm using chemical fuel, let's assume one ton of tug, dry mass of tug. Four tons worth of payload, so a medium-sized communication satellite, and it's going from 400 kilometer equatorial low Earth orbit all the way up to a geosynchronous orbit. Using chemical fuel, I'm gonna need about just shy of four k's a second of delta V, and let's assume my, my fuel is a non-cryogenic chemical fuel, which has about 320 seconds of specific impulse. Chemical fuel is really good for giving all the thrust right now, but it doesn't do so very efficiently. So, I'm gonna get my tug back at the end of it, right? So it needs to carry the fuel with it to come back, which means three and a half ton of tug and reaction mass for the return, which means seven and a half ton reaches geo, because it's four ton worth of payload, which means 26 and a half ton minimum wet mass in LEO, so I need about 21 and a half tons of propellant and pressurant to move the uh, fuel around in low Earth orbit. That sounds like a lot, and it is. Each mission requires a heavy lift launch vehicle for refueling. So I need a big rocket to put the payload in space and another big rocket to move the fuel up into space as well. And the cheapest for that is a Falcon 9 at 62 million. It's rated to do 22.3 tons to low Earth orbit, but no one's actually done that yet. The heaviest uh, launch payload a Falcon 9 has yet done is, I believe, about 11 tons. So it doesn't look like it'll be economical because you could just use a smaller rocket and less fuel, right? It'd be fine. You don't have, you just use a single use rocket rather than having a tug. Let's assume you use one of the other technologies, a Hall effect thruster. Because you're using an electrical system, you don't have the same physics behind it, you need a bit more delta V, but you've got a lot more specific impulse, you've got a lot more efficiency. So, same orbit, same payload, same tug, you're gonna need 1,300 kilos of tug and xenon fuel, which means 5.3 in geo, thus seven ton in low Earth orbit, so two and a bit ton of propellant and pressurant. It's a lot better. I'm really bad at putting together entire satellites. I'm just a propulsion geek. Uh, various Airbus and European Space Agency studies suggest about four and a half ton of xenon is required. Bulk aerospace xenon, that'll cost you about 1,200 US a kilo. It's not cheap. Falcon 9 could launch four Airbus tug fuel loads. That's about 20 million US per mission for fuel. It's still bad. It's getting better though but that's 20 million just to move the fuel up there. You've got to have profit because you want to turn this into a business, right? You're also going to need the cost of development, the cost of building your, your system, the cost of doing all your testing, the cost of insurance, because, oh boy, is there ever going to have to be insurance on this? It's going to be hard to see a, a price for less than about 50, 60 million US on this. And that's not really a, a, a good price point for a first try, at least. But if we use a different propellant with our pulse cathodic arc, we use molybdenum, which tends to give a better thrust to power ratio, but a bit less specific impulse, because we want to do this quickly. We have the same orbit, same mission. We're gonna need a lot less fuel all the way along. So we're gonna need about 650 kilos of molybdenum to do this. Scrap molybdenum is cheap. Yeah, three nine fine at 20 bucks a kilo. So your cost of buying your molybdenum is trivial. A Falcon 9 could launch 30 tugs worth of fuel. So your fuel cost is trivial, effectively. Sounds better, could be economical, we're going well, but you're gonna wanna get your um, system there on time, right? Because the faster your, your payload gets to the right orbit, the quicker you can actually start making money from your payload. You gotta look at this from the customer's perspective, of course. Shorter transit time means more revenue, more sooner. Nine month transfer requires 65 kilowatt electric to go to the thrusters. Put that in perspective, the entire space, a space station has about 300 kilowatts of power budget. It's gonna be a lot. It's within the bounds of various studies though. Airbus are looking at high powered systems in the 60 to high 100 kilowatts, designed for refueling, designed for multi-role capability, so you can service and repair stuff, and you can serve it as a junk hunter. Semi-autonomous system goes out, grabs other systems by matching orbits and then moving them to a destination. Move it to a safe graveyard orbit. 
when you've got enough in the same position, you can set up a smelter. And to do reprocessing, because it's going to require lots of delta V. And will need to be refuelable, and it'll have to operate for years, and it ought to be refuelable via in situ resource utilization. So you're going to need a smelter. So why not have one in orbit? Why not have as a module in the ISS, maybe as its own commercial station perhaps in the future? Use a space junk as your raw material. Process the junk into rod, sheet, and bar stock. Use the rods to refuel the junk and have any excess produced sold on the open market. You can sell construction materials that people want to build large structures in space. You can create a market and determine a price, therefore, for metals in space to grow an industrial economy. You're not going to have just the need for metals, though. You're going to need various other things in space as well. Smelters can be used to process minerals. So high ISP and a high cargo fraction means you can do mining tugs. They capture boulders from asteroids, bring them to the smelter, process them into more fuel for the tug if they have the right materials on board. The volatiles like water and ammonia and carbon dioxide can be used to run a life support cycle. Iron and nickel for structures, psyllium, gallium, arsenic for solar panels, the platinum group metals for chemical catalysis for your chemical industry in low Earth orbit. What you call a chemical industry, some people call a life support system. Very useful metals. So, uh, sorry, I'm running out of time, so I won't actually have the time to go through the numbers, but you can do a lot of modeling to look at how much fuel you'll need. Funnily enough, if you actually can refuel at the asteroids, you need a lot less fuel, and it's a lot quicker and a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do this. Uh, similarly for the belt, do, do, and concluding. Our thruster can keep, uh, help keep low Earth orbit beautiful by creating an economic incentive to recycle space junk. And by enabling the industrialization of space, people can do more cool things by creating demand, creating markets in space to feed an industrial economy. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. Thanks, Patty. No worries, Lana. Does anyone have any quick questions for Dr. Ooh. Patty Neumann? Sure, back. That's an excellent question. The question was, if we're going to have a smelter in space, how does it bloody well work, right? Uh, from, from a chemical and a physical and a metallurgical perspective. So, um, I like grabby robot hands. Grabby robot hands are cool because you, cause you can effectively have virtual reality gloves and headsets. So you can actually, you know, know what you're doing, right? And you don't have to redesign all your tools. To identify what the materials are, I would imagine that some clever soul would put together an electron gun and a, an X-ray photoelectron spectrograph so you'd shoot the electron gun at the metals you're looking at, and the backscattered x-rays would tell you what that alloy is. Some nice, easily coded for gesture like that would be able to fire the electrons, and you get the knowledge that this is an aluminum alloy or a titanium alloy. If you really want pure titanium, you'd need to process that out. If you just want that alloy melted down and reshaped, that'll be easier. For the purification, there are various people with various different ideas. No one's really done the work yet, so we don't actually know for sure what'll work best. One of the ideas is effectively a big distillation column. Because you've got your metals and they boil at different points, right? So you just distill out your titanium, your aluminium, your whatever. Another is, especially for minerals extraction, it's a carbonyl gaseous chemistry product, uh, process. You heat up your sample of stuff and you pass carbon monoxide over it, and it forms a volatile metal carbonyl salt, which boils away, and you again effectively use distillation, grab the carbonyl salt, run it through an electrolysis cell, take off the carbon monoxide for recycling, and you've got a pretty pure batch of that metal. Uh, this is described for an asteroid processing uh, smelter in a book published by the University of Arizona Press in 1990, 1991. It's called something like uh, Resource of the, of the Inner Solar System. It's a fascinating book. One of the last chapters deals with megastructures. One of the co-authors is one Carl Sagan. 